Chapter 12, The Cell Cycle. Up until this point, we've learned about the elements and especially the most important elements of the cell. We used those elements to build the four macromolecules of the cell and learned about their properties. Then we moved on to the parts of the cell, specifically organelles and their functions, and dove deeper into how the cell makes energy via mitochondria-driven cellular respiration or chloroplast-driven photosynthesis. We also discussed cellular metabolism and the role of enzymes in driving all of the anabolic and catabolic reactions within our cells. For the next six chapters, we will be focusing on aspects of molecular biology, biological processes going on within the cell at the molecular level. This chapter, we learn the cell cycle, which in simple terms is the life and death of the cell. But it's much more complex than that. We will walk through the stages of the cell division, conditions that call for division, regulation of cell division, and what can result when this very important process goes wrong. In this chapter, you will evaluate asexual and sexual reproduction as they relate to genetic variation. In particular, you will describe or model the cellular division process of plants and animals, Describe eukaryotic nuclear division by mitosis in order to be able to compare it to meiosis and contrast it with prokaryotic binary fission. And you will describe and map the eukaryotic cell cycle and the fundamentals of its normal and abnormal regulation. Before we get into the specifics of cell division, let's discuss the key roles of cell division. Living organisms have the unique ability to produce more of their own kind, which distinguishes them from non-living matter. Plant cells, animal cells, bacterial cells, fungi cells, and all other cells have this ability. To contrast, viruses do not carry this ability. They rely on a host cell to reproduce their genetic components and make more viruses. Thus, viruses are not considered living matter. The continuity of life is based on this unique ability to reproduce cells called cell division. In unicellular organisms such as bacteria and amoeba, division of one cell reproduces the entire organism. In multicellular organisms, thousands to trillions of cell divisions occur within the span of life. For humans, there are approximately 3 times 10 to the 13th cells in the body. That's 30 trillion cells and 10 to the 16th cell divisions in an average lifetime, which is 10 quadrillion cell divisions. Keep in mind this is a total number of cell divisions. Each individual cell can only divide 50 to 70 times before it dies. Remember, we all begin as just one cell, emerging of a sperm and an egg. We'll talk more about this in the following chapters. Multicellular organisms depend on cell division for three things, development from that fertilized egg, growth, and repair. Cell division is an integral part of the cell cycle, which encompasses the life of a cell from formation to its own division. In this course, we will learn about two types of cell division, mitosis and meiosis. Most cell division results in genetically identical daughter cells with identical copies of DNA. This type of division is called mitosis. The other type of cell division, meiosis, is a special type of division that can produce sperm and egg cells. We will talk more about this in the next chapter, chapter 13. All of the DNA in a cell constitutes the cell's genome. A genome can consist of a single DNA molecule, often a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid, and this is common in prokaryotic cells such as bacteria and will be located in the nucleoid space. Or a genome can consist of a number of DNA molecules, which is common in eukaryotic cells. DNA molecules in a cell are packaged into structures called chromosomes. Human somatic cells each contain 46 individual chromosomes located, of course, in the nucleus. Before we get into the stages of cellular division, we have to take a deeper look into chromosomes. 
Eukaryotic chromosomes consist of chromatin, the complex of DNA and protein that condenses during cell division. This prevents strands from becoming tangled and protects the DNA from physical damage. Every eukaryotic species has a characteristic number of chromosomes in each cell nucleus. Again, humans have 46 chromosomes, while Drosophila flies will have 8 chromosomes. Within a species, chromosome number will differ depending on the type of cell that it is. There are two main types of cells, somatic cells and gamete cells. Somatic cells are non-reproductive. In other words, somatic cells are all cells other than egg or sperm. This includes muscle cells, skin cells, blood cells, neurons, bone cells, liver cells, kidney cells, and all other cells within the body other than sperm and egg. Somatic cells all have two sets of chromosomes, one set you inherit from your mother, the other from your father. The other type of cells are gametes. Gametes are reproductive cells, the sperm and the egg. Gametes are special in that they have half as many chromosomes as somatic cells. Remember I listed the two types of cell division, mitosis and meiosis? All somatic cells divide via mitosis, while all gametes divide via meiosis. Meiosis creates non-identical daughter cells that have only one set of chromosomes, half as many as the parent cell. More on this process in the next chapter. To prepare for cell division, DNA is first replicated, a process we will learn in chapter 16, and the individual chromosomes condense. We'll use a muscle cell as an example. It begins with 46 chromatids. DNA replication doubles that number to 92 chromatids. That's a lot of strands of precious genetic material to keep track of in the cell, but the cell has a trick to keep the chromatids organized. The two copies of identical DNA remain tethered together, attached by a centromere. A centromere is a narrow waist of the duplicated chromosome where the two chromatids are most closely attached. The two completely identical molecules are called sister chromatids. And together, the two sister chromatids attached at the center by the centromere make up a chromosome. Notice the terminology I used here. Two sister chromatids, which are identical strands of DNA condensed with the help of proteins and held together by the centromere, are considered one chromosome. These two sister chromatids are what separate during cell division to ensure that each new cell has one copy of each of the 46 chromatids. Here is a basic model of replication and division. This cell begins with one chromosome consisting of one chromatid. We see on the right the two strands of chromosomal DNA molecules in a double helix for this one chromatid. In box two, the chromosomes have replicated. To the right, we see two double helices consisting of four strands of chromosomal DNA. These two chromatids are identical and are called sister chromatids. The sister chromatids are held together by the centromere. During cell division, the two sister chromatids of each duplicated chromosome separate and move into two opposite nuclei. Once separate, the chromatids are called chromosomes. We have now created two identical daughter cells with identical genetic material. Let's take a deeper look into the distinct phases of the cell cycle. The figure shown is a representation of an entire life cycle of a cell. There are two main phases of the life cycle, interphase and mitotic phase, or M phase. The first is interphase. Locate interphase on this figure. You'll notice that for most of the cycle, about 90%, the cell is in interphase. 
Interphase is the part of the cell's life involved with cell growth and replicating the DNA in preparation for cell division. It's also comprised of any and all cellular processes that allow the cell to function and stay alive. We see that interphase is further divided into three phases, G1, S, and G2. G1 phase means first gap. During this phase, many proteins and nutrients are made in preparation for DNA replication. The next phase is the S phase. S means synthesis, and this is because this is when the DNA is actually replicated or synthesized. The third phase is G2, which means second gap. In this phase, the cell continues to grow and make more proteins to prepare for cell division. By the end of interphase, the cell has grown, replicated its DNA, and is prepared to divide. The next phase is the mitotic or M phase. Mitotic phase denotes the beginning of mitosis, the division of the genetic material in the nucleus. The process of mitosis is further divided into five phases, which may sound familiar to you. Prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Following telophase, there is a special process called cytokinesis whereby the cytoplasm of the two newly created cells divides to separate into two identical daughter cells. Pictured here are images that represent the five phases of mitosis. I'm going to walk you through these briefly and then we're going to go through them again more in depth. Remember, Mitosis is defined as the division of the genetic material, i.e. the DNA in the nucleus. We replicated the DNA in interphase, so by the time the cell reaches phase 1, prophase, it has twice as much DNA as a normal cell. In prophase, we see that the DNA starts off loose and not condensed. It is beginning the process of condensing and it is still contained inside the nucleus. In phase 2, prometaphase, we see the chromosomes have condensed some more and the nuclear envelope which surrounds the nucleus is beginning to break down. Phase 3 is the most distinct looking of the phases and the easiest to spot. Phase 3 is called metaphase and it's differentiated by all of the sister chromatids lining up at the center of the cell which is called the metaphase plate. You'll also notice that at this point, the nucleus has completely disappeared, allowing for the chromosomes to escape to the center of the cell. This is a very important phase for mitosis as I will explain shortly. In phase four, anaphase, the identical sister chromatids separate to opposite sides of the cell. And the final stage of mitosis is telophase. In telophase, the identical sister chromatids have separated and we have two groups of identical genetic material. The nucleus is reforming and these cells are ready for the next phase of the mitotic phase called cytokinesis. Cytokinesis has nothing to do with DNA. It only concerns division of the cytoplasm to form two separate daughter cells. Now we'll take an even closer look at the phases of mitosis. Recall that 90% of the cell's life cycle is interphase, which includes G1, S, and G2 phases. During S or synthesis phase of interphase, the cell replicates the genetic material in the nucleus. This means by the time the cell begins mitosis of the mitotic phase, there is already two times the amount of normal DNA. You can see in the G2 of interphase panel the mess of DNA in the nucleus, which is still fully intact. You also see a new structure called a centrosome, shown in yellow. Each cell begins with one centrosome, which duplicates during interphase. Here they begin together on one side of the cell. Centrosome is the term for the amorphous structure, but the organelle responsible for its function is called the centriole. You can see 
the two pairs of centrioles pictured in the cell. They kind of look like rigatoni pasta. The role of the centriole will be formation of the mitotic spindle, a structure made of microtubules that controls chromosome movement during mitosis. Taking a quick look at the following two phases of mitosis, you can see the yellow spindle emanating from the centrosomes as asters, radial arrays of short microtubules. Prophase is the first official phase of mitosis. Remember, mitosis is the division of the genetic material, the DNA. As we move through the phases of mitosis, pay attention to three main things. The movement and formation of the mitotic spindle, the state of the nuclear envelope, and the shape and movement of the chromosomes. In prophase, we can see that the chromosomes have already begun to condense in the nucleus. Close observation will also show that each chromosome is composed of two sister chromatids attached at the centromere. The nuclear envelope is still intact here. The centrosomes have begun to move to opposite sides of the cell with early mitotic spindle emanating. In phase two, prometaphase, the chromosomes are completely condensed and the sister chromatids are still attached together at the centromere. The nuclear envelope is disintegrating, which is allowing for the mitotic spindle to reach the sister chromatids. The centrosomes have also reached the opposite ends of the cell. This is a good point to talk about a special structure called the kinetochore. A kinetochore is a complex of proteins associated with the centromere of a chromosome during cell division, which the microtubules of the spindle attach to. Remember, kinetic energy is the energy that has to do with movement, and the kinetic core is a structure that facilitates movement of the chromosomes. In prometaphase, some of the mitotic spindle reaches out from the centrioles to attach to the kinetic cores of chromosomes while other microtubules attach to opposite strands of microtubules. These are called non-kinetic core microtubules. The spindle microtubules that are attached to the chromosomes begin to move them inside the cell. The third phase of mitosis is metaphase. At metaphase, the chromosomes have been assembled at the center of the cell, which is called the metaphase plate, by the movement of the kinetochores. I want to bring your attention to a few important aspects of metaphase of mitosis. Remember, it's the sister chromatids which are lined up at the metaphase plate, and the sister chromatids are completely identical. We see the centrosomes at opposite ends of the cell with their asters of spindle microtubules emanating and attaching to the chromosomes. Spindle from both sides have attached to each chromosome centromere. This is crucial because this is how the identical sister chromatids will be separated from each other. This is so important that it's actually a checkpoint in the cell. If the mitotic spindle is not attached at both sides, the cell will abort mitosis. We'll learn why this is important in chapter 15. The fourth phase of mitosis is anaphase. In anaphase, the replicated chromosomes are split and the identical sister chromatids move to opposite sides of the cell. How do they do this? The kinetochore functions by moving along the microtubules toward the opposite ends of the cell. As it moves along the mitotic spindle made of microtubules, the microtubules shorten by depolymerization. From chapter 4, we know what it means to make a polymer or to polymerize. Depolymerization is the deconstruction of a polymer, in this case, the microtubule chain by removing monomers of tubulin protein as it moves. Non-kinetic core microtubules from opposite poles overlap and push against each other, elongating the cell. In the final stage of mitosis, telophase, genetically identical daughter nuclei form at opposite ends of the cell. We see the reformation of the nuclear envelope to surround and protect the DNA. Each cell contains one centrosome, 
with its pair of centrioles, telophase happens in unison with cytokinesis, which is the division of the cytoplasm. Again, mitosis is the division of genetic material, the five phases we just learned. Cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. You'll also notice the cell is beginning to pinch in the center. In animal cells, cytokinesis occurs by a process known as cleavage. The pinched in part of the cell is called the cleavage furrow. This is accomplished by a contractile ring of microfilaments that tighten until the cell is pinched into two. Plant cells have a different process for cytokinesis. Remember, plant cells have both a plasma membrane and a rigid cell wall made of cellulose. During cytokinesis in plant cells, a cell plate forms to separate the two identical daughter nuclei into separate cells. Prokaryotes, like bacteria and archaea, have a unique form of cell division called binary fission. In binary fission, the chromosome replicates beginning at the origin of replication. The origin of replication is exactly what it sounds like it would be. It's a special part of the genome that initiates DNA replication. Remember, prokaryotes like bacteria have a circular genome called a plasmid, unlike eukaryotes, which have multiple strands of linear chromosomes. Once the replication of the genome is complete, the two daughter chromosomes actively move apart and the plasma membrane pinches inward, dividing the cell into two. So now you've learned the cell cycle. Interphase, which is comprised of G1, S, and G2, and mitotic, or M phase, which is comprised of prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. Almost as important as understanding the phases of the cell cycle is understanding how the cell cycle is regulated in eukaryotic cells. Even without knowing it, you all know one consequence of irregular cell cycles, cancer. There are, of course, many types of cancers and countless causes, but a notable cause of cancer is dysregulation of certain genes, which can lead to loss of cell cycle control. We'll return to this in a moment. The eukaryotic cell cycle is regulated by a molecular control system called the cell cycle control system. The frequency of cell division varies with a type of cell. For example, the cells in the skin and those lining the intestinal epithelium of your GI tract are the fastest dividing cells in the human body. These differences result from regulation at the molecular level. The sequential events of the cell cycle are directed by a distinct control system which is similar to a clock. As you see in the image, the clock has specific checkpoints where the cell cycle stops until a go-ahead signal is received. We see three distinct checkpoints here in red. Let's take a look. For many cells, the G1 checkpoint seems to be the most important. If a cell receives a go-ahead signal at the G1 checkpoint, it will usually complete the S, G2, and M phases and divide. If the cell does not receive the go-ahead signal, it will exit the cell cycle, switching into a non-dividing state called G0 phase. Cells also have a checkpoint at G2 and M phase. I explain the M phase checkpoint while discussing metaphase. If the mitotic spindle is not properly attached to both sister chromatids, the cell will abort division. Two types of regulatory proteins are involved in cell cycle control. They are called cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases called CDKs. The cell cycle control system is regulated by both internal and external signals at those checkpoints. An example of an internal signal was given while describing metaphase of mitosis. 
Again, if the kinetochores do not attach to the spindle microtubules properly, a molecular signal is sent out that delays anaphase. Some external signals are growth factors, which are proteins released by certain cells that stimulate other cells to divide. A clear example of external signals is density-dependent inhibition, in which crowded cells stop dividing. Most animal cells also exhibit anchorage dependence, in which they must be attached or anchored to a substratum, which acts as a foundation in order to divide. Cancer cells exhibit neither density-dependent inhibition nor anchorage-dependence inhibition. Cancer cells do not respond normally to the body's control mechanisms. In fact, cancer cells may not even need growth factors from the body to grow and divide. This can happen for a number of reasons. They may be able to make their own growth factors. They may convey a growth factor signal without the presence of a growth factor. Or they may have an abnormal cell cycle, whereby the checkpoints are no longer serving to halt division of unhealthy cells. These factors may lead to the formation of a cancerous cell. When a normal cell is converted to a cancerous cell, this process is called transformation. Other terms for this are malignant transformation or tumorigenesis. Cancer cells that are not eliminated by the immune system form tumors, which are masses of abnormal cells within otherwise normal tissue. If these abnormal cells remain only at the original site, the lump is called a benign tumor. Malignant tumors are different. They invade surrounding tissues and can metastasize. Metastasis is the spreading from a primary site to a secondary site. Metastasis exports cancer cells to other parts of the body where they may form additional tumors. In this image, we see a tumor present in mammary gland tissue. This tumor began from a single cancer cell. As the cells in the tumor continue to divide due to a dysregulation of the cell cycle, the tumor cells invade neighboring tissue. Eventually, the cancer cells spread through lymph and blood vessels to other parts of the body. Recent advances in understanding the cell cycle and cell cycle signaling have led to advances in cancer treatment. To finish this chapter, try the multiple choice questions that follow in the lecture, and in the next chapter we will learn the stages of the other type of cell division called meiosis.